Hi. To continue on with our study of elementary particles, it's finally time to talk about quarks. So we have this guy right here, Mary Gelman, to thank for the idea of quarks and the term quark. Now, we're getting to some really modern physics, folks. This guy's not dead yet. Um, he's pretty old, um, but he's definitely not dead. This is a picture of him from 2012 at a scientific meeting. He's an American physicist, and he did a lot of studies dealing with um, subatomic particles. He came up with and named the quark, and he developed a pattern known as the Eightfold Way, which was the precursor to the standard model. He won the Nobel Prize in 1969, and he was a Renaissance man, as we'll see, with interest in many different fields and a great appreciation for literature. In fact, the idea for the Eightfold Way, the structure which led to, you know, explaining quarks, um, actually came from the Eightfold Path. Um, and this is an idea from Buddhism. In the same way I saw an ancient path, an ancient road, traveled by the rightly self-awakened ones of former times. And what is that ancient path? Just this noble eightfold path. Right view, right aspiration, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. I followed that path. Following it, I came to direct knowledge of aging and death, direct knowledge of the origination of aging and death, and blah, blah, blah. And I have revealed it to monks, nuns, and followers. So it's kind of a high aspiration, I guess, but maybe this is to particle physics um, what the Eightfold Path is to Buddhism. So the Eightfold Way is actually classification schemes that have been proposed to group particles into families. And the schemes are based on their spin, baryon number, strangest number, and now charmness, and so on and so forth, as we'll talk about. So it's a symmetric pattern proposed by Gelman and Niemann. Um, this is kind of similar to the idea of what was done with the periodic table originally, where they laid out the structure and then could predict vacancies in the pattern and postulated the existence of elements that hadn't been discovered yet. Well, much the same way that that happened with the periodic table, um, Gelman did that with the Eightfold Way, and he predicted the existence of particles that then later proved to be um, true. So the eighthfold way for baryons, here's the pattern. It's a hexagonal pattern, actually, for the eight spin one-half baryons, the proton, the neutron, the sigma, and so on and so forth. So what's happening here is strangeness versus charge is plotted on this sloping coordinate system that fits with the pattern of a regular hexagon. And six of the baryons form a hexagon with the other two particles in the center. So at top here, you have strangeness equal to zero. In the middle, strangeness number is minus one. and the bottom, strangeness number is minus two. Likewise, the charge is zero through the middle, plus one um, on the right, and minus one on the left. Of course, that's plus and minus E. Okay? So he noticed that pattern. And the mesons also followed a similar pattern. If you plot strangeness versus charge um, on that sloping coordinate system, then you see the same hexagonal pattern. But now you have more mesons in the center here. Okay, So the particles and their antiparticles are on opposite sides of the perimeter of the hexagon with the remaining three mesons in the center. If you do the same um, kind of plot for the spin three half baryons, now you have to add this extra line for the strangeness, okay, you have strangeness minus two and strangeness of minus three. The nine particles that they knew of at the time, here you have four plus three plus two is, um, is your nine. They were arranged that way, and then they noticed that there was an empty spot, and Gelman predicted the missing particle and its properties, and about three years later, they found the particle, and the predicted properties were confirmed. And that was a big um, success for Gelman's eightfold way. And this eightfold way led to quarks. Um, so there were so many hadrons uncovered, you saw the chart, and that's not even all of them, that it became clear that they couldn't all be elementary. Um, some of the physicists at the time actually found this very frustrating. Wolfgang Pauli exclaimed, had I foreseen that, I would have gone into botany. And Enrico Fermi actually advised his student, Leon Letterman, young man, if I could remember the names of these particles, I would have been a botanist, just because of all the great skill that botanists have at memorizing names, I guess. So the quark model in its modern form was developed by Gelman and Nishijima.
and the model received important contributions from Niemann and Zweig. So the spin 3 half omega minus baryon, which is a member of the ground state decouplet, was a prediction of the model. And when it was discovered in an experiment at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island here in the United States, Gelman received his Nobel Prize for his work on the quark model. So the quark, the term quark, actually also comes from a literary reference because, hey, this is Gelman. And here's the source. Uh, it's James Joyce from Finnegan's Wake. Three quarks for Muster Mark. Sure, he has not got much of a bark, and sure, any he has, it's all beside the mark. Um, so this is Gelman's quote about it. In one of my occasional perusals of Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, because, I mean, don't we all, you know, occasionally per peruse Finnegan's Wake, I came across the word quark in the phrase three quarks for Muster Mark. Since quark, meaning for one thing the cry of the gull, was clearly intended to rhyme with mark as well as bark and other such words, I had to find an excuse to pronounce it as quark. But the book actually represents the dream of a publican named Humphrey Chipton Earwicker, and if you don't know what publican means, in Great Britain, a publican is referred to as um, the name for someone that owns a bar or a pub. So this is a real big joke, I guess, in physics circles. The fundamental particle describing all things comes from a poem from Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce um, talking about the dream of probably some liquored up bartender. <laughs> okay, so the original quark model that uh, Gelman proposed had three types and they're called flavors because why not? Um, there's UDNS and that stands for up, down, and strange quarks. Now quarks have fractional electric charges, actually uh, multiples of one-third of the fundamental charge and associated of course with each quark is your antiquark because for every particle there's a corresponding antiparticle. So the antiquark anti will have the opposite charge baryon number and strangeness number to the corresponding quark. Now all the hadrons that uh, were known about at the time of the original proposal, now they've found a bunch since then, but at that time, they were all explained by the three rules and the three quarks. And mesons, the category meson, consists of a quark and an antiquark pair. And that gives them a total baryon number of zero. And baryons actually consist of three quarks. Um, and since quarks have baryon numbers of one third, then that sums to a total baryon number of one. Antibaryons consist of three antiquarks. So mesons, here's the quark antiquark pair, like you see for your pion or your kaon. That's your quark and antiquark pair. Here you have a, an up and anti down quark for your pion, and your kaon is an anti up quark and a strange quark. All right, and your baryons are your quark triplets. So your proton is two ups and a down quark, and your neutron is two downs and an up quark. It was noted that certain particles had quark compositions that violated the exclusion principle, okay? Quarks are fermions. They have half integer spins, and so they should obey the exclusion principle. So in order to explain why um, these fermions were not obeying the exclusion principle, they actually had to add a new quantum number, a new property. And that new quantum number or property is called the color charge. Now, of course, at the level of quarks, there is no such thing as color. They're way smaller than light, and color comes from light. So the color is just a name to give the charge, because why not? Charge, positive, negative is already taken, so let's call it color charge. So color charges come in red, blue, and green for RGB display, I guess, because when you combine red, blue, and green in an RGB display, it makes white, okay? So antiquarks have colors of, you guessed it, anti-red, anti-blue, and anti-green. So these are the quantum numbers of color charge. Color obeys the exclusion principle, and so if you have a combination of quarks of each color making up your baryon, then the exclusion principle isn't violated because you have a new quantum number and you have to have a red, green, and a blue quark to make one baryon. So since they're all different colors, no violation of the exclusion principle. Baryons and mesons are always colorless. Another quark was needed, though, 
because they found some new particles and they had even stranger properties than the strange particles, I guess. And so in addition to the original quark model was the charm quark. And you guessed it, a new quantum number, C, was assigned to the property of charm. Charm would be conserved, just like strangeness is, for strong and electromagnetic interactions, but not in weak interactions. And then in 1974, they found a new meson, the J-Psi. They named it the J-Psi because there were two groups that were competing each other that both found it. Um, and they discovered that it was sh uh, shown to be a charm quark and a charm anti-quark pair. Now, further discoveries led to the need for a more elaborate model, and this led to the proposal of two new quarks. So there's the T and the B quarks, and depending on who you talk to, T stands for either top or truth, and the B stands for bottom or beauty. Personally, I like truth and beauty, but top or bottom seems to be more common. So added quantum numbers now of topness and bottomness, and this was verified and found. The bottom quark was found in a Y-Maison in 1977, and the top quark was found in 1995 at Fermilab. So at present, people think they found it all. Um, the reason they think they found it all is because there's six leptons, and the leptons are fundamental. You've got the tau, muon, and electron, and their associated neutrinos, and that makes six. So now we have six quarks and it's just too beautiful of a symmetry for physicists to leave alone. So they think that we have these bottom strange down top charm and up quarks, six quarks in total, and we're done. That's what they think. So here's the particle properties of our quarks. Um, the rest energies are listed in the table here. You notice there's a lot of zeros in there. And that's because the rest energies of the quarks can only be determined indirectly. You can't isolate a quark. If you try, you'll just get two quarks. Um, <laughs> there you go. So the strong force is just too strong to isolate a quark. And so you'll see here in these columns, CSTB stand for the quantum numbers charm, strange, top, and bottom. And then here is the symbol for each of the quarks, the UDCSTB in the lower case. The antiparticles are indicated with a bar over the top. And remember that for the antiparticles, the charge and the baryon number are reversed. They become negative. So your up quark has a charge of plus two-thirds and a baryon number of plus one-thirds. But your um, anti-up quark is minus two-thirds and minus one-third. Okay, so it gets flipped. Um, these Quantum numbers, C, S, T, and B out here, they can be violated in weak interactions, but not strong or electromagnetic. So now this table at a right here that I stole from another book um, shows the quark composition of some of the baryons and some of the mesons. Remember the baryons are made from three quarks and the mesons are made from two quarks. So here down at the bottom are the quark composition of some common baryons. Particularly I want to emphasize the proton and the neutron. Um, the proton is two ups and a down quark and the neutron is two downs and an up quark, right? All right, so you remember when I was talking about the weak interaction, and I said that the weak interaction can make a neutron decay into a proton. So what happens there is that the neutron flips one of its quarks to an up quark, right? So the type of quark is changed. That can only happen when the weak interaction comes into play. It can change the flavor of a quark, okay? So that's what the weak interaction does for us. Only the up and the down quarks are contained in the hadrons that you encounter in ordinary matter. Strange, charmed, top and bottom quarks are uh, in very strange matter, not encountered in your day-to-day -day life. So here you go. Here's your meson. I'm not really sure why an anti-green is pink here, but there you have it. This is a green quark attracted to an anti-green quark, and this quark anti-quark pair is forming a meson. And when you combine a color and its anti-color, it's considered colorless. Here's a baryon with three quarks. Okay, quarks of different colors actually attract each, each other, just like the quark and the anti-quark pairs attract each other. It's just that the different colors attract each other less strongly than the quark-anti-quark pairs. Okay, but still very strong, just not as strong. So here you have your red, blue, and green. When you combine red, blue, and green, you have colorless, and that gives you a baryon. 
So particles, the quarks with light colors actually repel one another and those with opposite colors attract. That's why when you combine three quarks to form a baryon you get three different colors. So this is very similar to the idea of positive and negative charges which we're already familiar with. The different colors attract but not as strongly as the color and its anti-color. Yes, there's anti-colors, anti-red, yes, okay. The color force between color neutral hadrons is actually negligible at large separations. So if you have a colorless hadron and another colorless hadron and they're far enough apart, you don't get any attraction due to the color force um, in there. Yes, I just said color force. The strong color force between the constituent quarks, though, when you cram them together like in a nucleus, doesn't exactly cancel out if they're at very small separations like you'd find in a nucleus. And so this is what we mean when we say a residual strong force. We mean a color force, okay, from quarks that are bound together in color neutral particles but are close enough that still some color force leaks out, okay? There's a new field of study since the 1950s and 60s and it's called quantum chromodynamics. Of course, chromo means color, okay? So it's the study of how quarks interact with each other via means of the color charge and the color force. The strong force between quarks is often now called the color force and the strong force between quarks is mediated by the mediating particle named the gluon. The gluon is a massless particle. Sometimes if a quark emits or absorbs a gluon as it does during the exchange, you can get the color to change, which is kind of cool. We've never observed an isolated quark. It's believed that at ordinary temperatures, it's pretty much impossible to do that. That they're so strongly attracted to one another by the strong force that it's just not happening. Current efforts, though, of study include trying to form a quark gluon plasma where quarks would be freed from the neutrons and protons. Maybe then they could isolate one. This would mean, though, that they would need to recreate in a very small way the conditions of the very, very early universe before the strong force separated out. That would be some tough science. What happens when you try to separate a quark? Let's say that you have your quark anti quark pair here with a color and its anti color. Let's say that you're trying to do something and you separate it. What would happen is they would get far and far and farther apart, and then eventually, what would happen is they would snap apart, but the resulting energy would be enough energy, and this is how strongly they're attracted, that it would create enough energy to create a new quark anti quark pair and then the two quarks that you just tried to isolate it would be paired up with your new quark anti quark pair and it wouldn't work so there you have it now quantum chromodynamics the way that they would explain the neutron proton interaction or the strong force in the nucleus is they would say that each quark within the proton and the neutron is continually emitting and absorbing gluons and the energy of that gluon can result in the creation of these quark anti quark pairs so you have this exchange going on and when they're close enough these gluons and virtual quarks can be exchanged and that produces a strong force so that would be their explanation of why uh, neutrons and protons interact and stick together in the nucleus. All right, so it's a bold new world, folks. You've got your color, you've got your color force, your red, blue, green, and your anti-red, anti-blue, and anti-green, and it's actually a lot of fun, but you have to sort of dive into the oddness and get into it. All right, well, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I hope you're at least having fun with this idea. Uh, I have a lot of fun with it, as you can tell. And uh, just let me know. How's it going? Bye.